And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Annie Raha, who's had five near-death experiences, which we're going to learn about and more. Annie, thank you for joining me and welcome. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate you having me. Let's just talk about them in chronological order. So let's start with the first one. Sure. The first one, um, I'll start with me running downstairs. I took a lot of um, sleeping pills. My mom had a surgery and she was given some sleepy pills, sorry, sleeping sleep aids. And um, I took a lot of them. I think they were like 60 to 70 left in the bottle. And I ran downstairs to call my best friend, tell her I love her. And um, I remember as soon as I hung up saying I love her and I miss her and um, I put the phone down, I felt. And then all I remember is in the background, it's like, I felt like my ears and eyes were muffled and something was covering my vision. The sound I was hearing was very muffled. I heard my dad take me to our family physician's clinic who has seen generations of our family in Pakistan. And I saw the look on his face and he was horrified. He hurried me into a private back examination room. And he told my dad, you got to take her to general hospital. Um, and he was scared. And at that time in Pakistan, suicide is a crime. Um, you can be punished. You can be prosecuted for it. So, and it's a taboo too, for a young girl to do something like that. Um, so then I see my dad with our driver and my mom. And at that time I realized I was seeing things from somewhere else. I was not witnessing things happening to me, like, you know, in my body, I was not in my body. That was the first time I realized it. And I saw my dad and the driver, my dad, the driver, you know, break this red light, just go to the hospital, take her to the hospital. I see my body being like brought to the hospital. Somebody was carrying me on their shoulder. Um, I think it was my dad and he, the nurses and the doctors and the security guard are like, we have to call the police. And my dad's like forcing them, telling them who he is and telling them to start working on her. You can call the police, but you got to start working on her. I remember a nurse coming, saying something to my mom about and um, because, you know, that's the first thing that comes to mind as a teen teenage girl. Why, you know, is she in the condition she is in? Did something happen to her? And my dad's like mad at me. I can see like he's mad at me. Um, and then I remember this really soft white light started to appear. It was really bright, but it was very soft. And at the same time, I remember a really young physician coming next to me with nurses next to me with a bucket. And I don't remember seeing my body after that. I just remember that really warm light. And I finally see myself floating above my body. My body's on a hospital bed and I'm like right on top of it floating. And I'm seeing things from like a bird eyes view. I see other patient beds around me and I'm like oh my god like, like I'm in a, I'm in a ward I'm in a hospital that was the first time something like literally like light bulb uh went on in me like I'm dying or I'm dead and um and then something compelled me to zero on into my head my face um the body's face and I saw my mom just crowding my face just in she had so much pain in her face. And um, I heard a voice say, she will be like this for the rest of her life. And you must go back. She needs you. Your job is not done. Your work is not done. And I just remember waking up, um, vomiting into a bucket and Somebody from the hospital was like, police is coming. And as I finished vomiting, my dad puts me over his shoulder, throws me in the car, and then we drive back home. And I realized I had just almost died and come back. It's, that was my first experience. And 
we had an extremely violent household and I have memories of protecting my mom from my dad since I was four years old. Um, something that shocked my parents when as an adult of two children at that at that point when I first started talking about it with my parents, they were like, wow, you remember this? And I'm like, yeah, I can't forget it. So I came back the first time for my mom. Thank you for sharing your experience with us. You're welcome. Who do you think that voice was that was talking to you? I don't want to say it was God, but the voice was so welcoming, so loving, so generous. It gave you a feeling of unconditional love if you've ever experienced it. It gave you a feeling of you're safe. I'll be watching you. I'm sending you back. But yeah, your job is not done. But there was also a sense of I got your back, go back. And I can't describe, but it's something that I wish I can hear again, especially when I went through some really hard times in my life. Not that I want to die, especially as a mother, I'm responsible for my children, but I long for that sense of safety and calmness and love that I heard the few times that I heard it. And I don't know what it is. Have you discovered what the job is that you have to do that wasn't done at the time? I've been working with survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault since I was 15. And um, the work I did in Pakistan was behind my parents' back because my dad was in bureaucracy in Pakistan. It's frowned upon. You work with NGOs or nonprofit or non governmental organizations as they're called back home. You're considered westernized. It's taboo. Your daughter is westernized. Your daughter is corrupt. And uh, being a feminist is a taboo. My dad had a real big problem with me, but having certain opinions since I was a kid. So it doesn't matter what line of work I go into. I keep on getting calls. People gravitate towards me who are suffering. And that's why after the last NDE, I did end up forming a nonprofit. And um, I believe that's my calling is it's th therapy for me too. It's it makes me grateful and for my life as Brenda, some people think it is or what I went through, they can't believe it. For me, it's also, I pull myself out of that. Life is beautiful. It can be beautiful if you want to see it that way. Um, so yeah. Well, it's a great service that's needed. Let's jump forward now to your next NDE. The next NDE was an attempted at honor killing. Um, I won't name the family member, but I was called to come downstairs to my parents' room where my siblings and one of our maids was there. Um, the maid was told to leave the room as soon as I came in. And it was because of my ex-husband. I had to marry him because he beat me and my father was not happy. It was a stigma. Um, his family was not equivalent to us in education or anything. There were so many differences. My dad was not happy. My family was not happy. And I couldn't even tell my parents what actually happened to me. So they thought it was a love marriage because my father, my family, they were so upset that his mom and his sisters used to be in Pakistan at that time, even though he was from Seattle. And I was told his mom and sisters will be raped. They, you know, were going to cause chaos. We're, we're headed to his village because he was from a village and we're from a city. So that's another big thing that was frowned upon. And in order to protect his mom and his sisters, I had to play this thing of, you know, I, I found a guy, I fell in love and I'm going to marry him. And it was just, that was the only way I could keep my dad from not taking any drastic steps. And he also made it very hard for me. He, as soon as my dad found out that I had married him behind his back, it was a big problem. And the only way you solve problems like that in families who have, families who have reputation in the community, you know, in, in the country is, is an honor killing. You claim your honor back. I remember being strangled and not strangled, sorry, choked with hands, with bare hands. 
And I remember seeing the face on top of my face, just so much anger. And I remember my mom standing in the back, kind of shocked, but I felt like maybe she knew something, but then something changed in her face. And she came over to that person and tried to pull that person off of me and saying that you're going to kill her, stop. And I remember not fighting back. I wanted it to be over. I just wanted to hear that voice. I was like, I'm ready. Please take me. I want to go see grandma. And I remember I started blacking out. And I remember seeing that really bright, soft white light again. And I just hear my mom screaming and the grip of the grip on my neck. It was kind of loosening, but it was still steady. Some air got into me because I couldn't breathe before that. And I heard that voice telling me, it's not over, go back. And I was mad. And then I remember stumbling out of my parents' room, going up the stairs to my room. And then I don't remember anything after that. That was, um, the second one. Did you stay angry for quite a while afterwards because you had to come back? I was confused. I was not angry. I just couldn't believe it. I'm like, how much more am I going to go through this? Like, I survived childhood killings. It's one of those things where I'm like, when this, when does this end? Like, what am I here for? What, what, what do you mean? Go back. Like, am I supposed to come here to suffer more? Like you want me to suffer? Am I paying? Did my dad, did my forefathers, like, did they commit some sins that I'm paying for? Am I, you know, suffering karma for my forefathers? Like what, what did I do wrong? And it was just one of those things where this was a very huge part of my life until my last ND. So I wasn't angry, but I was very lost. I guess you were just under the assumption that you were responsible for all this. I did. I felt like I was paying the price for something either I did in a past life, even though as a Muslim, you're not supposed to believe in past lives, or I'm paying the price for it sins committed by my father, my uncle, or my forefathers. I don't know what sins they committed, but am I paying the price for this? So. To me, I was like, all right, maybe this is just meant to happen. Like, this is my life. This is my destiny. So I'm going to keep moving you through your NDEs until after the fifth one. And then I figure at that point, I can kind of ask general questions afterwards. So if you don't mind, let's move to the next one. The next one was also a second attempted honor killing. And I was in my room, in my bed. I saw the family member walk into my room. I saw the look in that person's eyes and I knew what was about to happen. And I didn't fight back. In fact, when the person came closer to my bed and the hands came closer to my neck, I actually, like I was, I had a blanket over. I, you know, moved the blanket to the side to make it easy for the person because I was like, you know, I just don't want to be here. I'll make it easy. And I just remember just staring in that person's eyes, trying to figure out if I can make, make sense of everything I had gone through since I was a kid. Does this person have any love for me? And I hope that person knows I didn't mean to let the family down or it wasn't my fault, but I didn't want to say anything. I just wanted it to be over. And I remember I couldn't breathe. I started reciting the Kalma, the Shahada. And I started saying, God, please forgive this person. I forgive this person. And I remember just being in a very dark black space. I couldn't figure out where I was. And 
There was no voice. There was no soft, warm, white light. And I don't know how long I was there. When I woke up, it was the next day. This happened early afternoon. And when I came back to it, it was like 9 a.m. the next day. My mom had gone to her job. My dad had gone to his job. Our brother and sisters had gone to their college and school. And I went downstairs scared, not knowing if I was dead or alive or what I'm going to find. If I'm alive, would they shoot me if I go down? Like I just went down and I saw the maid just doing her chores and she asked me if I was okay. I was like, I'm fine. And I just went back to my room and I figured either that person thought I was gone or the person couldn't go through with it a second time. So that was the that was the third indeed. I think you said the word shahada. What does that mean? It is one of the kalmas. Like when you become Muslim, you have to recite the shahada to proclaim that you're a Muslim. You believe that God is one and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the last prophet. You're asked to recite that during your last hours as you're dying, as you're taking your last breath, because that means you can go to heaven. You can be forgiven for the sins that can be forgiven. Um, so that's what I was doing. And I was also saying, I forgive you. So feel bad. I forgive you. And I would recite the Shahada. And then I couldn't breathe. And yeah. It sounds like to me that you went to the black void or something, and perhaps you were conscious for a little while. And then you, even while you were there, you just kind of went unconscious. Something like that. I can't explain it because it was so different than the first two times. And just knowing that much time had lapsed. I just knew something had happened. I just don't know what. Did you feel any different about coming back that time versus the other two because it was such a different place? I did. Oh, I knew something in me was telling me it's not over. That's the lingering feeling I had the third time was impending doom and it's not over. There's more to come. I just did not know what was that more. So, all right, let's move to the next one. The fourth NDE was after a third attempted auto killing, and this person could not even, the hands were on my neck, but couldn't do much and just walked out of my room crying. And I had some sleep aids from a physician at that time. And I had some beta blockers due to palpitations I was having out of stress. I emptied both bottles. And I remember taking those pills. I just remember my sister coming in and she looks at the bottles and she's like, what did you do? or nothing she's like this person was in your room are you okay and I said yeah I'm fine don't worry and at that time I didn't want to call my best friend I didn't want to do anything I didn't want to be discovered I'm like man the last time I got discovered I don't know how fast this is going to work I just remember being in my room and just blanking out it was dark it was so dark, I couldn't remember anything from that. All I remember is when I did come to it, I was in the downstairs living room. On the carpet of the living room, the tables had been moved to the side. And nobody talked about what happened, how I got there from upstairs to downstairs. All I remember is just a very black void. It was silence. And it was like somebody was upset with me. That's the feeling of love, unconditional love, safety that I got the first two times. 
the fourth time it was like somebody was really upset with me and I just felt like my god I'm such a failure I can't even kill myself and that's all I remember from the fourth time okay and then let's move to the fifth one I think is when you had some sort of final revelation right yes it was I had my third child with my ex and he was only two months old. I lost a lot of blood during that C-section. My ex was never ever concerned about my well-being. I remember having severe, severe chest pain. I could not explain why. And I was in the healthcare field. I just know I wasn't related to my heart, but I also knew I'm gonna die if I don't tell anybody about this. I didn't tell him because he would think like, he would say things like, well, you're making it up. You're just exaggerating. Even though my first two C-sections, you know, I was, I bathed my kids in the hospital within the first like 10 hours. I went back home, cooked within the first 18 hours. I was cleaning. So, and I had C-sections. So it's like one of those things where people talked about that kind of stuff. Oh, you know, Annie started doing this right the day, you know, 24 hours afterwards and stuff like that. So the third time when I was struggling health-wise, even his mom, my ex-mother-in-law said something's not right with her because she was up and cleaning and cooking within 24 hours of the first two C-sections. This is different. That allowed me to be comfortable enough that his mom said something to say, I'm having chest pain and I don't know what's going on. Like there are times I can't breathe. And he ignored it. He's like, well, you'll be fine. No, you're fine. And I just remember within about 40 minutes of having that conversation with him, I was in the living room of our home in Seattle and I was curled up in fetal position with one cushion pressed against my chest because I felt like I needed to stop this pain. I just don't know how. And he gave me another pillow. He's like, here, you know, like put this, it'll, it'll help you put more pressure. And I remember then him bringing the baby next to me and he's worried about the baby nursing and the baby's latched onto me while I'm curled up in a fetal position and I'm nursing him. That night went by, I could not understand what this pain was about. I just knew something I'm about to go somewhere. I felt like I'm gonna I'm gonna die. I'm I'm about to die. I just had this feeling I'm I'm dying. And the next day was Saturday. I remember waking up in my bedroom and I looked at the time. It was like nine something and I was like oh my god like I didn't make the kids breakfast I didn't make him breakfast the baby's probably hungry I don't think I nursed him since last night and I remember him coming in at the same time and I was like I'm sorry like I just you should have woken me up and he's like oh, I already took care of the breakfast but he gave me the baby to nurse and I nursed the baby and I remember I couldn't get out of bed I gave the baby to him and I was like can you please take him I just need to find some energy to get out of bed. I'm going to shower, I'll make lunch. But he took the baby out, but something in me was like, call Zara. Zara is a very good friend of mine that I've known since high school in Pakistan. Um, she was originally from New York and she moved to Pakistan somewhere like in sixth or seventh grade. I should have known her since seventh grade. Um, and then moved back to New York. And then we kind of connected back via Facebook over here when I moved here. I remember something and she's a physician assistant so she something in me was like call Zara right now I call Zara I'm like she's, she's asking me how you're doing and I was telling her like about the chest pain and what happened and her exact words were Annie I think you have pancreatitis you should call an ambulance and get out of there now and I'm like I call my my ex over and I'm like you know Zara just said this and he's like no I think you're just tired you'll be fine um, and then he was like, you know, the baby's not on formula yet. The baby has to nurse. So you're going to be fine. It's going to take that many hours in the ER, you know, call Dr. McHugh, like my PCP and, um, see if he can see you. And I used to work with Dr. McHugh. Then he became my primary care provider. So I started justifying in my head. I was just all in my head. It can't be bad. It's not bad. And then something in me was like, call Alicia, call Alicia. And I could not get that feeling, like that voice out of my head called Alicia. And I remember 
waking up and it's now it's the afternoon and it's like past 1 p.m. And I'm what happened? And how come I don't remember anything in between? And I kind of had a realization, I probably passed out in my bed. So I call Alicia and Alicia's like, Annie, I'm coming. I'm taking you to the ER. I call in my ex, he's upset. And I just remember trying to find the energy to put my clothes on. So pack a bag with the phone charger at the minimum, give my kids kisses. My friend was there, she lived nearby. And I remember sitting in front of Valley Medical Center in Renton, Washington. And I'm telling her about the pain I had the night before and how bad it was. And she knows I'm very high quality for pain. And she's like, something's not right, Annie. And, um, and then all of a sudden I start feeling better. And then I also start feeling guilty that, my God, I don't know how many hours it's going to take. The baby's going to be hungry. What is he going to have? What if the formula is not good? And, you know, he has gas issues or stomach issues. In my head, I'm like, I should probably go back. I remember sitting in front of the emergency room store in her car and she's like, Annie, go. And I'm like, Alicia, I think I'm okay. I feel better. I Just take me home. And she's in her, uh, I can't talk like Alicia, but she was like, you better go in there. Or I'm dragging you in there. And I was like, all right, fine. I'm here. I'll just go get checked out. And it's Saturday, you know, the kids won't be disrupted that much. And figure it out. I go in, I get triaged. And something in me was I like, call back home. I call my youngest sister. And I'm seeing as they put me in a room right away too, after triaging me. And I'm telling my sister, I don't feel good. Something's not right. And as I'm hooked to the monitor, I'm looking at my blood pressure numbers and they're dropping. I think one of them was like 73, 40 something. And I was like a FIFA, like something's something that happened, but it's not his fault. And all I remember is after that, there was a really soft white light, that bright light that I saw the first time. It made me so happy. I was just so happy seeing that bright white light. I just knew I was safe and it's over. I see my grandma who I love so much. I never saw my maternal grandmother. She died and my mom was an undergrad and I only knew my paternal grandmother. It was, I called her daddy and me. I see daddy and me with her arms open and she's like, I'm so sorry for what you went through. Just come, just come here. And I saw her and like a child I wanted to just run up to her and hug her because the last time, the last time we met right before her death, it's like we would hug one another to say goodbye after our visits until our heart was full. And it's like, I would get a smile from her and she would be like, it's going to be okay. Cause she knew what I was going through at home with my parents. And the last time we met, when I left after seeing her, she couldn't let me go. And there was no satisfying smile from her. And something in me told her I won't see her again. And she died two weeks after that. But when I wanted to run to her and she's there with her arms open, I see my grandfather. I see people from my family who had passed away. And I saw a classmate who had passed away due to cancer. I'm seeing people that I know are on the other side now. And I'm trying to run to her. But it's like my feet are stuck in cement. That's how it felt like. And I'm looking down and there's something invisible going into my body. I'm like, oh my God, I'm I'm dead. I'm dying. And that's the first time I that's the first and only time I saw my body was when I'm trying to run to my grandma and my feet wouldn't move. And I knew there was something still keeping me down there. And I hear that voice, and that voice is like, you need to go back. And I'm saying to the voice, can I hug grandma? And the voice is like, you need to go back. Your work is not done. And I felt like a two-year-old just wanted to like throw a fit and a tantrum. Every conversation I had with that voice, it wasn't like you're saying words. I can't explain it. It's not like you're speaking a language. It's like there's something in your head and there's something in it. You, I, I don't know how to explain it. It's a conversation you're having, but there's no language involved. There's no. It's telepathic, action. right? Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, that's what it felt like. And the voice is like, all of a sudden I see this thing kind of open up 
and I see my kids alone at home with the baby. And I tell my grandma, I got to nurse the baby and the other two are too little. I, I got to go back. But when I'm telling her that, something in me just changed. When I said, I got to go back, that was the first time I said, I got to go back. It came with such responsibility because, and I'm hearing the voice say, your job is not done. Your work is not done. I see my grandma's face in pain. It's like she knew what more was to come and she can't protect me from it. So I also knew there was more to come. And as I'm looking at her, I'm wondering why can't she just walk up to me and hug me? It was like there was some kind of invisible barrier that she couldn't cross. And I had to cross that barrier to get to her. And um, I was upset. But then I also knew I was being selfish. My kids need me. And I tell the boys, only till the kids are old enough. And the voice is like, your work is not done. Why, like, why can't you listen? Just go back. And I remember coming back. I remember just like getting, having this really heated thing in my head. I felt that warmth, that heat in my head, in my body. And it's like, fine, I'll freaking go back. I'll go back. Like, I'm going back. And then I remember opening up my eyes and my ex was hit, sitting at the foot of the hospital bed. And I remember seeing his face and it looked like it was just white. And then I called his name and his, he just turned his face and it's like he got blood back in his face. And I'm like, where are the kids? And he's like there with mom and dad. And I was like, when did you get here? I didn't, cause I know I didn't call him, ask him to come because I didn't want to bother him. I didn't even want to bother him. I asked my friend to bring me here and I was going to ask my friend to pick me up when I was done being seen. So he's like, they resuscitated. You almost died. And he was really worried, genuinely worried. And then he called the nurses and a physician kind of popped his head in there. And he's like, hey, you have pancreatitis. You went into shock. Just like that which I understand being in healthcare myself. And um, I asked him what time it was. And he's like, whoa, it's 11-11. Uh, At that time, I did not know the significance of angel numbers. But um, that one changed me big time. It was something just changed in me. I had a light bulb moment I can't explain I changed my bedroom I moved myself downstairs from my ex separated from him um stopped going to his family events community events where we were invited because of his parents I just stopped everything I stopped being who he wanted me to be and who he had turned me into because that's just what an authentic me I was a different person when I was in Pakistan I was vocal I was outspoken. I was a feminist. I was protesting on the streets. I was working with women and children who went through what I went through. And I was doing that work in the U.S. too, but more covert where it was community members or family friends, their daughters or their wives. And I was doing it quietly. But after that incident in 2015, I did not care. I'm like, you know what? Life is a blessing. This is the fifth time I was told I was sent here to do something. I'm going to freaking do it. And I don't know what it is. Like just something just changed. I got that confidence back. I got a conviction back. I just knew I had to be myself. After all of these NDEs, did your religious beliefs change in any way? I've struggled with my religion from a very young age. And I'm not, I don't hide that. There was a time in my teenagers where I stopped believing at all. And then I started studying Bible, Torah, and even the Hindu religion. And something kept on bringing me back to Islam. And it was more of the feminist laws that 
not the ones that the mullahs have created afterwards, but the actual Islam um, that was present during Prophet Muhammad's time. So, so, and it was one of those things where it kept on bringing me back because I'm a hardcore feminist. But then there are certain things that I struggle with that are in the Quran. And I'm like, why is that there? And I've been told by my mentors, my spiritual leaders, people I turn to for questions and answers is that Quran was written for a different time. Just because it says kill all Jews and Christians over here, it doesn't mean you go kill all Jews and Christians now. This worst came at a time when Muslims were at war and they were winning a lot of battles and they took a lot of Jew and Christian prisoners of war and they told them, you, you teach, I forgot it was nine or 10 Muslim kids to read and write, we'll let you go. So what they started doing was they started spying. So now they're teaching nine or 10 Muslim children to read and write, but they're being let go, but they're also carrying secrets. And at that time, the Muslims started losing bars. They were, you know, losing body count and it, they were getting hit. So it was like, kill them, don't show them mercy. So it was for that time and that time only. It doesn't apply today. So that's how my spiritual leaders tell me when I, I think there's a verse that really bothers me about when you can hit a wife or something like that. It's about, you know, having, it's okay to have sex with slaves, just the, things like that. Like there's things in the Quran that bother me, but I do practice Islam, but I have my struggles. Before we started recording, we were talking about Barzakh, which is a mm -hmm. realm you go to before death, which I, I'm assuming is talked about in Islam. Do you think that that the lighted realm you were in would be considered Barzakh or even the dark realm? I do. I do think it was Barzakh or some, I mean, if that's the name for it, that's the name for it. I've heard it from patients who are from different religions over the years. Survivors I worked with over the years describe similar things in Pakistan and USA. So I know there's something there. We give it a name because, you know, you, you gotta have nomenclature. That's that's what nomenclature is. And it's Barzakh for me as a Muslim. I do believe it was Barzakh. But I can't explain the two differences that I had in seeing that soft white light three times and then seeing a black void two times, and especially the fourth time that feeling of anger I got and like somebody was just really upset and disappointed in me. I just couldn't shake that off. I, I can't explain the two contrasts. After any of your experiences, did you have any new abilities? This is a tough one to talk about, but there were no new abilities. Uh, my family, my friends, people I grew up with, people I lived with, for a longer time, like my ex-in-laws. I see things in my dreams and they come true, whether they're good or bad, and it scares me. I don't know. Well, now I know, especially the last two years, trying to working with a, a spiritual leader and a mentor as well. Um, they're called downloads. And I will get downloads in certain things and they would also come true the two most recent one kind of blew me away. Um, those abilities were still there. I just never accepted them. I was scared of them. Um, I just don't talk about it with a lot of people, but when something compelling, like I, I remember the suicide bombing I survived in Pakistan in 2009. I had these downloads for about seven weeks before I left US, I was telling my, ex-father-in-law and his friends and my ex-brother-in-law, my ex-sister-in-law, something's going to happen to me when I go there. And I thought the worst thing that can happen to me as a mother of two really little kids, because my oldest was two at that time. And my daughter, I only had two kids at the time. She was nine months old. I was like, I'm going to lose my kids. I'm traveling this far from Seattle to Lahore. I'm going to lose my kids at the airport. They could get abducted. Something's going to happen. And I get to Pakistan within 24 hours of landing. I was in a suicide bombing with my sister. And when that bomb flew very close to me, 
I remember people around me falling, glass walls shattering, just gunfire. But I remember I had a sense of calm. I cannot explain. It was, and it just happens a lot when things are happening that I was being prepared to know that they're occurring when they, when I'm in the middle of it, I'm just calm. I can't explain it. It's like, I was like, thank God, now we're over it now. And that feeling of impending doom that I had for seven weeks, it went away. And I remember getting a call from my ex-father-in-law's best friend in Pakistan asking me, because it was a big thing and people are calling from all over. He's like, you know, you got a Kali Zuban. Kali Zuban means black tongue. And um, I was like, what? He's like, yeah, you said, he told me my exact words were, if it's not my time, a bomb can blow up right next to my foot and I will not go. And he's like, you caused this. And I've heard this multiple times in my life where people like, you caused this just because I said something. But I'm like, people can't cause things because they said something. I just knew it was coming. So yeah, so that's, it's, I don't like talking about it because that whole taboo that comes with it about having a Gali Zuban, a black tongue. Um, but there are some times where I can't control the urge because it's that severe and I say it. Do you fear death at all? No, I never fear death. I never fear death as a child, way before my NDEs, never fear death. Has the memories of these experiences faded over time? No. Nope. They are as vivid, as intense, like the day they happen. And sometimes, depending upon where I am in my life, what kind of emotional state I'm in, uh, sometimes I have to revisit them to remind myself. I don't know if it was a contract I made with somebody that I'm going back, then I finish my job, and then I can go see grandma and be with my grandma. Like, I remind myself there's a purpose of me being here. And... I just need to keep going. After experiencing all this and knowing what your job is, do you ever sit around and think like, what's wrong with this world? Like, why is there so much violence here? Yes, it has a lot to do with my belief. One, it's harm. It's a continuous generational cycle of trauma and abuse. It's childhood trauma too. Hurt people hurt people. I went through a lot in my life. And if I start projecting the anger, the sadness that I got from my experiences, I could hurt a lot of people, but I chose different for myself. And I see people in their 50s and 60s, and some of them are really good people, really good, well-intentioned people. But they're so reactive. They're so impulsive. Their trauma has taken over their life. The hate that they hold for somebody else, wanting revenge, wanting to see somebody else suffer as much as they did, it just keeps them from raising to a higher vibrational level and they're stuck in that. And that misery perpetuates around that person. I've been in energy or space with people like that. And just being in people like that space, it drains your energy. You can feel that heaviness. You can feel... It's like somebody just sucked the life out of you. And I can't explain it. It's I believe hurt people hurt people. But at the same time, at some point in your life, you have to take ownership of your own happiness, of your recovery. And you have to tell yourself your trauma does not define your destiny. And you got to move on. You can actually turn this into something beautiful and help others around you. We would have a different world if people choose to just heal because it's a choice. It's a conscious choice saying I'm going for therapy, but if you're not making use of it, it doesn't do anything. In preparation for today, I was looking at your Facebook profile and it says you are a blogger. So are, what are you doing? I mean, are you like um, speaking out or blogging about women's rights and stuff? I use my Facebook platform for that a lot, but I am. Um, I've been asked by multiple people, so I'm kind of looking into it. I was asked to start a YouTube channel and I was asked to start doing it online. I had somebody reach out and offer to pay for like a website hosting and stuff. And they're like, I need you to talk about what you went through. It's important. Um, I had multiple community leaders step in, prosecutors 
um, with my own case that I went, you know, I because we went through a lot and my ex had to be held accountable for certain things. And I had prosecutors come up to me and they're like, you need to start speaking up. You don't know how much power you have. And so, yes, I, like I said, I think I told you before we started talking, the last four months have been nothing but introspective. I've been pondering it, what my purpose is. Why am I fighting this? Why I'm vocal. I'm, I don't shy away from telling my story, but, and then I get messages from people like women all around the world, even men, because I've helped men too. And they're like, we saw what you talk about because talking about even things like childhood, childhood sexual abuse by a family member in Pakistan is very tabooish. Again, you can get killed for that. And I've had women reach out and they're like, I went through this too. But you know, it's like, I see the impact happen when I tell my story, when people just out of nowhere call me because my phone number is out there. I work in the community or I have a Facebook message sitting and it's like, wow. And I found my healing through my voice. And just to know that somebody for the first time in their life, like there was a woman, she's 84 years old. And she said, for the first time in my life, I sat down and thought about when I was raped as a child. And I couldn't even use those words for myself. I couldn't even accept what happened to me was negative. And when I saw you talk about it, she's like, I actually had to go into a place where I never thought I can go. And her relationship with her therapist changed after that. So it's like, not by just working with people in my community, there's other people out there who I don't even know. I When I put something out there, I don't understand the impact of it. Like I said, my voice is my healing. I put it out there when I'm compelled to, when I have an urge to, and I see the ripple effect of it. So I'm probably going to take on one of the offers. Well, after watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions or ask you for help. Are you open to that? Absolutely. I never turn anybody away. What's the best way to contact you? I think my phone number is already out there. You can put my phone number out there. I can send you my email address. You can put a link to my Facebook profile. Um, okay. I'm, I'm open to it. Annie, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Yes. We all have a duty to heal ourselves. We were not in control of when we were hurt. It wasn't a choice, but healing is a choice. And I want everybody out there to not minimize or trivialize what they went through and just heal themselves. Please heal yourself for yourself, for your children, for your community, for this world. This world would be a better place if we all come from a healed space and understand to never heal truly 100% in this world. It's just knowing and acknowledging that you went through pain and you're working towards releasing yourself from that pain. Annie, thank you for your message and thank you yeah. for being my guest. You're welcome. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.